I mean, it's mostly EDM. It's mostly Chan, but... Okay. Okay. So, we are on life. <웃음> 자, 저는 그냥 불려온 사람입니다, 여러분. <웃음> <웃음> 안녕하세요. EDM INT의 헤더입니다. 그래서 박수 치지 마세요. <웃음> 꼭 이렇게 하지 말라고 하시면 하시는 경우가 있더라고요. 어쨌든 지금 제 옆에 킹스 에듀케이션에서 오신 레이스 선생님이 계시는데 오늘 여러분들한테 아주 피가 되고 살이 될 수도 있는 아 이렇게 말하면 안 되죠? 피가 되고 살이 되는 IELTS 점수가 1점 이상 올라가는 그런 강의를 해주실 건데 혹시 여러분들 리지스터라는 단어에 대해서 알고 계십니까? 자, 게스 해봅시다. 리지스터. 여자분들 표정 지금 어떠신지 아시죠? <웃음> <웃음> 그만해. 그리고 얘기하고 가. 약간 이런 표정인데. 말투. 에요. 어, 영어 말투인데. 이제 어쨌든 IELTS에서는 <웃음> 여러분들이 라이팅과 스피킹에서 어쨌든 필요한 그런 말투라든지 어투라는 게 있죠. 그래서 이 부분에서는 어떤 게 포멀한 랭귀지이고 어떤 게 인포멀한 랭귀지인가 이거에 대해서 오늘 중점적으로 설명해 주실 겁니다. 그래서 Shall I finish? Can I finish now? <laughs> okay, so I'll give to Lise now. Oh, thank you so much, Heather. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good evening. Nice to see you all here. Nice to see you guys too. So, um, I'm going to be giving this lecture today all about register. If you have any questions, then please feel free to ask them. You can address me as Madam, like a queen, yeah? Queen of kings. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I changed my mind. So actually, you can call me Ms. Gilbert. Oh no, 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 no. We're all friends here. I changed my mind. You can call me Elizabeth Gilbert. <laughs> oh no, 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 still no. We're friends, we're friends. Look, we're all eating, everyone's having a drink, having a nice time. You can call me Elizabeth. No, 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 change my mind. <laughs> so, please call me Liz. If you have any questions, please call me Liz. Okay, so my first question for you is, what is register? If you've heard about register, put your hand up. No? Did you communicate with me? Did anyone communicate? <laughs> yeah, you did. You didn't put your hands up, but by not putting your hands up, you said no. Okay? So this lecture is about register, but it's also about communication and why communication is so important and how register can help you doing your IELTS exam, but also in general in your life speaking English and even speaking Korean. So, let's take a look. Register. Do you know this one? You go to a shop, you buy something, yeah? Cash register. When you go to class with Captain Heather, yeah? <laughs> this one? Present, absent, present, absent. Register. Register is everywhere. But what do we mean by register. What about the shoes? What kind of shoes are we wearing today? I've got some sneakers on, yeah? Do you think like this or like this? This one or that one? Maybe in the middle, right? Register is complicated. So register is all about power. What's power? Be strong, yeah? But power means many things. Power influences how we communicate and what outcome we get from our communication. When you talk to someone, usually you want a reply, yeah? You ask a question, you want an answer, hmm, yeah? The register sets the tone for the outcome and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, as an overview, we're going to be looking at formality and power. Usually, 
teachers will say the more formal your language, the more power you have. But, secret, that's not always true. <laughs> We're going to be talking about language characteristics, different characteristics of formal and informal, and the middle, semi-formal register. And then we'll move on to why does it matter? Why do we care? Is it important? Then we'll look at what makes, la what makes language informal, what makes language formal. We'll look at lexical frequency and precision. Now this is a very long phrase. It just means how normal is a word? How often do we use it? A word like hello, I'm a beginner in English, I know hello. Even in Korean, I know hello. Annyeonghaseyo. <laughs> That's about all I can do, but I can say hello. Yeah? So it's got a high lexical frequency. If I say supercalifragilistic expialidocious, that's got a lower lexical frequency. Yeah? We don't say that very often. Then we're going to look at discourse markers. Hopefully from your IELTS classes with Captain Heather, you know about discourse markers. Yeah? Therefore, sometimes, so, next, in conclusion, these kinds of phrases. Yeah? Then we'll talk about long and short words. Does it matter if a word is long or short? In your IELTS speaking, in your IELTS writing, sorry, in part two, you have to write 250 words. Can you just write ah, 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 250 times? <laughs> That's not a good idea, is it? No. Mm. And we're going to be talking about why this is important for IELTS, which I'm guessing is why you're all here. And then we're going to be talking about how to improve, how to think about exposure and note taking. Now, note taking is a very underestimated part of learning a language and I want to really try and sell that to you today why it's important to take notes and not just any kind of notes but good notes and what makes good notes and then I'll be talking about the importance of reaction acknowledgement and creation okay so that's what we'll be talking about in this lecture. And if you're watching online, please feel free to ask any questions as well. So, how many words in English? A lot. Yeah? Yeah, it was a lot. So, the Oxford English Dictionary contains full entries, so a complete entry for 171,476 words. Oh my God. Do you know all of those words? No. Do I know all of those words? No. Does my boss know all of those words? No. He thinks he does, but he doesn't really. <laughs> so let's have a look here. We've got a nice little graphic and you can see 51% of these words are nouns. We know what a noun is, right? Table, noun. Light, noun. Liz, noun. <laughs> adjectives, what about these? 25%. Do we know what an adjective is? Can anyone give me an adjective? Pretty, beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what about verbs? We've got 14.29%. Very precise. An example of a verb? Come in, come in. That's a verb. <laughs> and other, so 9.71%. We've got exclamations, conjunctions, prepositions, and suffixes. So, exclamation, ah! Conjunctions, and, so, theretofore, therefore. I'm going into legalese now, this is discourse markers. Prepositions. Who likes prepositions? I do. No? No? No online fans? They're very useful, but they're very annoying because they're always different in the other language. Why? I don't know. Suffixes. So things that we can add to words to change the way that the word is made. So, English has got a lot of words, right? We don't need to know them all. Not for a band nine in IELTS, not to be a native speaker, but 
it's always fun to learn more words, right? Yeah? Yeah. Now, my question, power. Who in a society has power? Why won't it stop? <laughs> I'll go back a second. There we go. Who in a society has power? Who do you think? Who's powerful in Korea? President. president. I was going to say BTS, but sure, the president. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And what do we associate with power? <laughs> it's kind of come up very slowly. What do we associate with power? So these are some things. Money is important. To be powerful usually means to be rich. Yeah? I'm sure the president has enough money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. BTS certainly do. <laughs> Education. If you think of someone powerful, they're good at talking to other people, right? It's a sign of education. They're intelligent. Do we agree? Yeah? yeah? Opportunity. So if someone's powerful, usually they've had opportunities to become more powerful. Yes? You don't become president of any country just by arriving outside the president's house and saying, hi, I want to be president. No, you have to work for it. Another important thing is force or might. Do I mean the modal verb might there? No, I mean a synonym of might. Of force, might is all about strength. So to be president, you also need to have physical power or physical power behind you. I think he's got an army, hasn't he? Maybe some of you have been part of the army, yeah? <laughs> and trust, the last one. Is trust important for power? Well, it depends if you believe Michel Foucault, but that's another story and another lecture and a different discipline. So yes, trust can be important. Um, but power is also about language. Language is power and power is language, right? So I'm going to teach you a new word. It's a difficult word and it won't come up in your exam because it's too difficult, but it's a fun word. And like 51% of the words in the English language, it's a noun. It's shibboleth. Shibboleth. Oh, it's fun to say, isn't it? Shibboleth. Shibboleth. Yeah, very good. So shibboleth means that something is like a special custom or a tradition or a word or a phrase that shows that you're part of a group. So, for example, if I say to you, oh, Liz is such a TMT, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah? But for anyone who's watching that doesn't know Korean or has never been to South Korea, they might not know that expression. So I'm using a shibboleth. I'm showing that we belong, that I understand you and you understand me. This is the power of language and this is also the power of register. So, formality and power. We've established that using formal language and having power are linked, they're related, yeah? So, in English, who has the power in this picture, do we think? Which people are powerful? We've got ooh, someone here, looks like a bottle of wine or maybe it's soju. <laughs> um, then we've got someone, ooh, ugly nose, but he could get that fixed here. Over here, someone carrying a lot of things. Maybe he needs to visit a dentist. <laughs> More on that later. And over here, oh, look at these people. Who has the power? Do we think these ones or the other ones? Hands up for these ones. Yeah, yeah, these ones are the powerful ones. Why? What kind of language would they speak? The same as me? Or different? Where did English come from? Hmm? Yeah. So, very good. We've got two main roots into English. We've got Anglo-Saxon, so a long, 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 long time ago. Before the Romans, we had 
the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes came into England and from them, this is why English and German have some similarities. We've got words like eat, go out, think about, pig, cow and sheep. We know pig, right? Wink, wink, cow, moo, sheep, bear, yeah? Um, and then on this side, we've got the Latinate. So this maybe comes from Latin, from the Romans, when they invaded England. But maybe it comes from Old French also, when the French invaded England. I'm a little bit bitter about that still. So we've got consume. What does consume mean? Eat. Consume. Which one is more formal? Consume. Consume is more formal. Go out, exit. Which one is more formal? Exit, yeah. Consider, think about. Consider, yeah. Pork, beef, mutton, pig, cow, sheep. Which one's more formal? Yeah, because this is the name for the meat, right? And this one is the name for the animal. Now, if you were alive in this time, long, long, long time ago, and you spoke like that, you were probably a farmer. You weren't someone that ate the meat. So that's why the words are different in English, because the rich people ate the meat, the poor people raised the meat. So. Formality and power. How does language have power over us? Well, let me give you an example. So, I'm giving this lecture, but unfortunately, I have a baby with me. Hello, baby. And I need to get rid of the baby, but it's a baby. I can't throw it away. What shall I do? Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I can't take the baby with me to the lecture. I have to leave it, but I need to give it to a person. It's a baby. I can't just put it over here. So, luckily, two people, two men, come into the office here at EDM. Now, they both look exactly the same, same kind of haircut, same clothes, just jeans and a shirt, and they both walk the same, same colour, eyes, same facial features, everything, same, same. How do I choose which person is better to leave the baby with? So I ask both of them, so why should I leave the baby with you? And person A says, oh, well, you know, I shall do whatever is necessary if you entrust me with this small child. And the other person says, oh, you know, I'll be all right. I'll look after it. <laughs> Which person do I give the baby to? A or B? A. Ah, yeah, A. Formality and power. My baby disappeared. Formality and power. So by using more formal language, I somehow show myself to be more trustworthy. More trustworthy, right? Maybe. Okay, so let's think about some characteristics of formal and informal language. Which side, first of all, do you think will be the formal words and which ones will be the informal? So am I formal or informal? Formal or informal? Yeah, very good. Right, so formal language. We think of it as serious, yeah? Objective. Now, by objective, we mean no opinion, just facts, the truth, maybe. Impersonal, not close. Reasoned, controlled, reserved. If I'm reserved, I'm kind of shy, but not really shy, just ah, not crazy, okay? By contrast, we've got our informal language. So in formal language, we might think of as being light and humorous, personal. So I talk about myself. Casual, oh yeah man, just chill. Loose, simple. So that's true, but why? 
Why is it true? So let's think about that. Why does it matter that it's true? Maybe that's a better question. So most teachers will tell you that register is receptive. You're in a context and you decide what register to use. Maybe you're going to the bank and you're going to speak to the manager about getting a loan. Would I use formal or informal language? Formal or informal? What do you think? Formal. Hello, Mr. Bank Manager. It was so lovely to meet you. Oh, could you possibly? Oh, I was just, would you do me the great honor? Yeah, we use formal language. Do I know the bank manager? No. So I'm going to be more formal with him, right? And maybe for a job interview, what kind of language do you think I would use if I want to work as a teacher here at EDM? Hmm, yeah, because it's a formal situation, right? <coughs> hmm. So most teachers will tell you this, that language, that register is receptive. You are given a context and you choose how to react. I would argue, and this is a bit of a secret that I'm giving away here, that we create the context. So instead of thinking about the register once you get the context, think about it beforehand. What is the outcome of the communication? What is your goal? What do you want? That decides what register you should use. And as I did at the beginning, it's natural and normal to change register very quickly within a conversation. So in English, we don't have a formal you, right? But if I was speaking Korean, there would be maybe a formal you and a more informal way. Maybe at first I will be formal, and then we get closer, we get closer, we get closer, and then I'm informal. Yeah? The same in English, but we do it in a different way. So, official or serious situations are often signalled by the use of formal language. While ordinary or relaxed situations are signalled by the use of informal language. Sometimes, but not always. Formality of language varies in relation to such factors as public versus private. If it's the president's birthday, and we're going to the president's birthday party in the blue house, we're going to speak to each other very differently than if it's my birthday and we're on the seventh floor and we're all having some cake together. It's a different context, yeah? The size of the audience so if it's, I'm in a huge stadium, I'm going to speak differently than I would if there were just two people in front of me. The relationship of the speaker or the writer with the audience and so on. So it all depends on the situation. It depends on the context. This is one of my favorite words and is so important for any exams and for IELTS. Context is everything. And finally, the ability to be able to vary your language according to the situation is often considered a mark of an educated person and a fluent language user. So if you really, really want that high band score in IELTS and if you want to maybe study abroad in the UK or the US or another English speaking country, the ability to show an examiner or show someone in an interview that you can vary your register dependent on the situation is a very valuable thing. It shows them that you kind of have a shibboleth. You know the way in to the English language. And one of the ways into the English language is to use the right language for the context. So, fun bit now. What makes language informal? Simple grammatical structures. So things like present simple, I am, you're right, what do you think? Things like that, simple questions. Do we play EDM at EDM? I wish. Personal evaluation. So when we're using informal language, we're going to be using I, something that we wouldn't do if we were using 
formal language. You're right, you're my friend. I can say you to you because we're being informal. Colloquial, do we know this word, colloquial? Like everyday language. So one that I can use with my friend or with my family. Um, something that's more spoken than written. Colloquial English like wicked, in it bruv, chill. Slang vocabulary, we know slang. Oh, I'm trying to learn Korean slang, it's very difficult. <laughs> very, very difficult. <sighs> Maybe you've seen in some of the other live streams, oh, it's really hard. <laughs> and the use of high frequency Lexis. So I talked about lexical items, and maybe you know lexical resource. Do we know this term? Lexical resource? No? It's one of the areas that you're marked on in your IELTS speaking and in your IELTS writing exams. All it means is vocabulary. So. When we're thinking about high frequency Lexis, we're thinking about words we use all the time. Hello, good, thanks, nice, please. High frequency wor words, yeah? Shibboleth is the opposite of a high frequency word. Before I gave this lecture, I'd maybe said it once in my life. I'd seen it many times, but that's because I went to university in the UK, so I would read fancy books formal register books, in fact. Now, what makes language formal? Well, kind of the opposite. So formal language, even when spoken, sounds like written English. It is often believed that one may have to use a formal register in order to get a good grade in the IELTS exam. However, I sound like a book, not a person. Yeah? This is a marker of formal language. And although when we're speaking we try not to worry, especially in English, we don't worry too much about formality. But in writing, it's important. Yeah? Why? Why is it important? So, when you write, you don't usually see the reader, do you? So you have to convey a message to them. And as I said before, it's all about the context. So if I'm writing a message to my mum on a text app, I will write in a very different way than I would an email to my boss. So with my boss, maybe I'd use more formal lower frequency words, I'd use more latinate words. Hello Daniel, I am hoping that the weather is wonderful in London. Are you having a wonderful time? Please tell me, could you possibly? I will use all these features of formal English. If I write to my mum, I'll say, hi mummy, I miss you, how are you? Things like that. I'll use words that are high frequency, everyday, easy, easy English. How do we show difference in formal English and informal English? Well, that's something that we're going to look at very soon. So formal language does not use contractions. You'll know this from your part one and your part two writing practice, right? You do not use contractions in formal and informal, informal English. We avoid personal pronouns. We don't like to use you, I, us, me and we, we like to use the passive voice. Many people believe that. It is often thought that, things like that. We use more polysyllabic words. This is a formal way to say this. Formal, difficult, informal, easy, yeah? Kind of. Kind of. We use complex, complete sentences. So in your part two, if the question is, many people say that sports is an important part of education, however other people believe that sports are unnecessary and time should be spent on 
science, languages, and maths, you're not going to say, yeah, OK, I think that's right. That would be a really bad answer. Band zero. You haven't even attempted the question. And we avoid using colloquial or slang vocabulary when we're speaking in formal English. So we're not going to use our favourite kind of words like all right, in it, chilling. No, not in this situation. We're going to be impersonal. We're going to use the passive voice. Oh, apparently someone wants to know about where I, I sang Korean songs. Oh, did we do a, a Korean one? Oh, we did. We do a lot of karaoke at EDM. It's an interesting way to learn, both English and Korean. And I would argue, slang, oh yeah. We did British, we didn't do British slang though, we did Korean slang. TMT, INSA. <laughs> that's all I can remember at this time. <laughs> if you want to help me, that's fine, please help me out. So we're going to use also learned words. Learned words. So normally we say this learnt, right? Past of learn. But in this case, learned, meaning educated words. Longer words, more difficult words. That usually, as we saw in our other slide, way back with the man with the bad teeth, here, there's usually, if you have a formal word, there will be, in English, an informal equivalent. Is that true in Korean? Sometimes? Yeah? In English, it's true most of the time. You can usually say something in either way. You can use the more formal word, oh, I'm, I'm going to consume a caffeinated beverage. Or you can use an Anglo-Saxon word like, oh, I'm going to have some coffee. Right, let's get back to where we were. I'm going to break the computer. So, lexical frequency and expression. How can we say this picture? How can we describe this picture? We could say, she went into the room. True? That's fine. Is it good? Well, it's the correct form of the past, for one, so well done. The word go in the past is went. Woohoo! I love it when students get irregular verbs right. She walked into the room. It's okay? Yeah? She strolled into the room. No? It's okay? Not sure. Okay, I'm going to walk into a room. Okay, we're imagining the room starts here, okay? Walking into a room. Now I'm going to stroll into the room. Is she doing that? She could be. Could be. She sauntered into the room. Oh, beautiful word. That is band seven plus vocabulary, people. <laughs> she sauntered into the room. Does anyone know this word? No? Okay, so you've seen me walk, you've seen me stroll. I'm going to saunter now. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> I think I own the room. I own the room. I saunter. You walk with swagger, yeah? She marched into the room. Same as saunter? No. How do we march? Left, right, left, right, left, right. It's different. Yeah? So which of these phrases do you think is more formal and which is more informal? She went into the room. Formal, informal or neutral? Neutral, very neutral. She walked into the room. Neutral. If you wanted to say only formal or informal, you would say informal because 
We say go and we say walk a lot in English. They're high frequency words, not low frequency words. What about stroll, saunter and march? Are these words you hear every day? No. So would you say they're more formal or informal? More formal, yeah, that's right. Ooh, offline lectures, online lectures. Okay. What about this? She marched into the room aggressively. Am I going to walk like this? Maybe I'm late, I'm angry, I lost your homework, I'm in a bad mood, yeah? So I'm gonna march aggressively. What kind of word is this? Adverb. Adverb, yes, describes the verb. She sauntered awkwardly into the room. Now let's, I'm gonna try and do an awkward saunter. It's gonna be difficult. <laughs> Awkward saunter. Okay, so what do we have here? We're becoming more and more precise with our language. So the first sentence, she went into the room. Generic. Maybe boring, I don't know. Here we have something much more precise. So generally speaking, we'd say informal, formal. However, you think formal, more difficult, informal, easy. Oh, what about, she just went into the room. What did I do? Is there a difference between she just went into the room and she went into the room? Same or different? Yeah. So in the first one, I did something that native speakers do all the time in their language. I use my voice to change the meaning. Yeah. She just went into the room. She sauntered like she owned the place. Just went into the room. So I changed the stress. And this is something that we do often in informal speech. Did you major in acting? I wish. <laughs> all my students in London say that too. They say, why are you so crazy, teacher? Well. That's a different story and nothing to do with formality and informality. So when we're speaking informally, we tell things that we say in the formal way by the way we speak, by the tone of voice. Am I happy? No, I'm really angry. I'm using informal language, but you can tell because of the way I speak, what my mood is, how I'm feeling, if it's a question or if it's an answer. So that's something to also consider, especially in your IELTS speaking exams, because that's a whole 25% of your grade. Thinking about pronunciation, are you able to use natural features of spoken speech? Which, things that we do a lot without thinking. So, would you like to ask me a question? I raise my voice. Rising intonation for a question, falling intonation for an answer. She just strolled right in. I'm changing the way that I speak for a particular purpose. That, band eight, band nine, okay? Really good speaking. Right, frequency, precision, and detail. So we've seen on the previous slide that formality and specificity are intertwined, they're linked. The more formal your language, the more specific it is, the more precise. Let's look at some examples. So, table. We all know this word, table. Desk, what's a desk? A table for work, yeah? A table for writing or a table for work? Knee hole desk, I don't know what that is. Specific desk, more specific. Which one do you think is the most formal? Table, desk, or knee hole desk? Yeah, because it's the more specific, the more precise word. Oh look, types of desk. There's our knee hole desk. Oh, my mother has one. Can you see it? Yeah. 
We don't have these at school. Let's look at another example. We've got vegetable, potato, and baby potato. So we're going from the general category to the type of vegetable to the specific breed of vegetable. More specific. And hat, cap, flat cap. I've got to find a flat cap. Peaky blinders. Here we go. Flat cap. Very specific. So an important characteristic of formal language is that it will be more specific. However, in order to be formal, what do you need? A really big vocabulary. Not necessarily a really big vocabulary, but you need a bigger vocabulary. Which is great for you guys, because you're all IELTS students, right? And to do well in all aspects of the IELTS exam, you need to be really good at synonyms. Anyone want to tell me what a synonym is? Word that has the same meaning. Yeah? Yeah? So table and desk are synonyms. Almost. Near enough. And paraphrase. Do we know what paraphrase is? Yeah? How to say something that means the same in a different way. So, to be better... Oh yeah, peaky blinders. Thank you, Heather. Um, so, to be better at English, we need to increase our vocabulary. And to do better in the IELTS exam, we need to increase our vocabulary. We need to learn more synonyms, and we need to be able to transform the words. It's one thing to say, I consider this an important thing. It's another thing to say, the consideration of this is an important thing. I did a little word transformation there. I made a verb, consider, into a noun, transformation. Now, discourse markers. These are difficult. We know discourse markers? Do you know the word and? Yeah. You know discourse markers. That's a discourse marker. Okay? So a discourse marker is a word or a phrase that is relatively syntax independent. It does not change the true conditional meaning of a sentence. It kind of has an empty meaning. Discourse markers are things like this. Actually, frankly speaking, of course, I would like to say. What does actually mean? Sorry? To be honest, can do. Doesn't really mean anything. There's no meaning. So, look at this woman. Does she look happy? No. She woke up one morning Let's call her Yu Jung. She doesn't look like a Yu Jung, but that's okay. She woke up and she had a pain here. What do you think was wrong with her? Toothache. Perfect. Yeah, she had a toothache. So she went to, a, oh, what's it called? She went to a shop that had a picture of a tooth above it. Yeah. And she went in and she thought, oh, I'm in the right place. And the woman looked at her and she said, oh, oh, and so the woman that worked in the shop said, oh, come on through, come on through. And she thought, oh, I'm in so much pain, it really hurts. Toothache really hurts, doesn't it? But at least she was in the right place. Oh, you should go through, you should go through. Oh, and so then there was a, a person with a white gown on and a hat, yeah? And so she said, oh, sit down, please sit down. And she thought, oh. Oh, she can help me, she can fix my problem. And so then she said, oh, lie back, open your mouth. She gets ready. She hears the sound of the drill. Zzzz, and it stops. And the person standing behind her, wearing the gown and the hat, says, actually, I'm not a dentist. <laughs> yeah, actually. So actually really means, if you look it up in a dictionary, it means I'm going to tell you some surprising information. But when we use it in spoken English, you're right, it doesn't have a meaning, it's empty. 
it usually we use them as empty placeholders, you might call them. So they're great to use in the speaking exam because it buys you time to think. Actually, well, frankly, hmm, that's an interesting question. It doesn't mean anything, but it gives you a second to think. And then you can give them an answer. Good. So let's move back to thinking about our, we had our kings and queens on one side and the people, the farmers, on the other side. We have our long and short words. So Latinate, this is a fancy grammar word. You don't need to know this word, agglutinative. It means you add things to it. Glue, like glue, you know, to stick together. So in Korean, if I want to say a verb in the past, I add something in the middle, right? Yeah, it's agglutinative. English, is both agglutinative and uses phrasal constructions. We've got Anglo-Saxon and Latinate words. So, here are some examples. We've got discover, same meaning, find out. Explode, blow up. Invent, come up with. Enter, go into. Tolerate, put up with. Investigate, look into, surrender, give up. So depending on the situation in English, we can change what language we use. We can decide and we make the decision, the speaker, I. Do I want to use a more formal Latinate word or do I want to use an Anglo-Saxon phrasal verb? Now phrasal verbs have those things that we hate in them, don't they? Prepositions, yeah, yeah, they suck. Hmm. But, problem, native speakers use these ones all the time. If I'm talking to someone, I am 90% more likely to use these than these. So you must learn your phrasal verbs because they are so useful in showing to the examiner in the IELTS exam, to whatever you want to use your English for afterwards, that you can use register, that you can choose the appropriate language use. So, let's think about IELTS speaking now. Everyone's favourite part of the exam? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, I love it. So much fun. Okay? So, a mistake that students that are very good at English often make is they use too much formal vocabulary in IELTS speaking. And this can make their answer sound very stiff and unnatural. Let me give you an example. So, maybe the question from the IELTS examiner is, hmm, uh, where do you live? So we're thinking part one of the exam. They're trying to relax you, make you calm down. And you say, um, I live in a, I reside in a modern, multi-storied edifice. Do you understand me? No. What do I want to say? I live in a flat or I live in an apartment. That's what I want to say. But I use such formal words that no one could understand me. I sounded so weird when I was being formal, right? Yeah? So given the context, you want to use language that is every day. You want to use high frequency words, particularly in part one. Part two, uh, semi-formal. Part three, maybe you want to start throwing in some of your Latinate verbs, more formal language. Showing the examiner that you've got a nice, high lexical resource, showing them that you've got all of this vocabulary. However, back to what I was saying at the beginning, context. You want to set the context. So when you walk into the exam, you can go up to the examiner and maybe you'll say, oh, hello, nice to meet you. Oh, yes, I'm oh, very nice to pleased. To <laughs> oh, lovely, thank you. So kind. Oh, yes. Um, so my name is Elizabeth. What, what's your name, sir? I'm Oh, yeah. again? Yes, Kyung Hoon Kim. Oh, lovely to meet you. Oh, yes, okay, thank you. May I sit down? Oh, thank you very much. Well, you can call me Liz. Oh, what did I do? Formal, 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 informal. I set the context. Nice. So, writing, moving on. Again, too formal. 
So a common mistake that high level students make is to use overly formal language. When we're writing, sometimes maybe we'll use therefore. Yeah, if it's a formal essay, sure, therefore is fine. But there is nothing wrong with and. There is nothing wrong with next. There is nothing wrong with so. If you're going to use formal discourse markers like therefore, use one or two, not 20. It looks very unnatural again. Furthermore, oh, frankly speaking, I would like to say, so I'd ask you to listen to naturally produce conversational English. How is it written, how is it different to written English? What else could I say instead of furthermore? So, in addition, next. On the one hand, on the other hand, things like that are great. But furthermore, whew, practically we're in court, okay? Is it a court? I hope not, yeah? So how can you improve your English to improve your ability to do all of these things? You need to listen to naturally produced conversational English. How can you do that? Well, you can start by watching my lectures. You can also watch Netflix, you can watch YouTube videos, subscribe to podcasts, all of those things where you're listening to people talk the way that they really do in real life. This is going to help you so much. Now to my favorite topic. Note-taking. So, the best and the perhaps the only way to learn informal and neutral register is through exposure to naturally occurring conversational English. Because we don't write in this manner. When we're writing, we're always using a more formal register because we don't know the reader. So, you need to practice your speaking by listening to other people speak. It is crucial, this means you must, more formal, you must find opportunities to practice using English from a mixture of registers. You don't just want to be able to say, she went into a room. You want to be able to say, she went into a room, she ran into a room, she loped wildly into the room. You want to be able to do all of that. And the only way to do that is to hear and understand and reproduce all these different levels of register. It's also very important that you record the information relating to register. So I don't know about you, but when I learn a new word or when I teach a new word, I'll tell students things like, oh, what was our word last week? Ah, courgette. What is it in American again? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what's, the what's courgette in American? Courgette? Zucchini. Zucchini, that's it, yeah. Right then. All right. So, what can you tell from my note? One of them is British English, one of them is American English. If I'm a good student, and I am, I'm a nerd. I will write this afterwards. What does that mean? Noun, yeah, exactly. So it tells me what else, what kind of word it is. I could also write so instead of we have a formal word, tolerate, and a phrasal verb for Heather. So tolerate, oh, hmm. okay, if I have to, I'll put up with it if I have to, I'll tolerate it. Maybe I don't like it, but I can understand it's necessary. Like you and phrasal verbs and prepositions. Hmm. Okay, all right teacher. So when you're making notes, please think about adding these features to your notes. Make a note of not only the part of speech, is it a noun, an adjective, an adverb, a preposition, a suffix, a prefix. What kind of English is it? Is it 
British or is it American? Is it formal or informal? Can I find a synonym like this that has a different register? All of this will improve your word map, it will improve your lexical resource and it will help you on the way to getting that higher band score in your IELTS exam. So when should we use formal, neutral and informal language? What do you think? Whenever we want. So you think about what do you want the situation to be? What kind of outcome do you want from this event? What level of register will help you achieve your goal? So when you walk into your IELTS exam, you want to show the examiner that you're a confident user of English. So you say, hello, pleased to meet you. You start formal and then you transform. Oh, my name is Liz. Cool. You show them that you can use both because that's the outcome you want from the situation. You want a high score. So you want to show that you can use and change your register when appropriate. And the key word there is change. How can you change your register when it's appropriate? How do you know? Listen, speak, read, write. Practice, practice, practice. There's no magic answer. I wish I could do this for you. Be a Harry Potter and wave a magic wand and make you all native speakers right now, but I can't. That's the only way to get there. Practice. So the question for you is why? Choose your situation. Why? Oh, accents. Oh, I do love an accent. So I'm going to read this statement for you in a variety of different accents. I, so can you tell from my accent what country I'm from? England. Yes, I'm so formal and British, like, like the Queen. <laughs> but I'm also from London, innit, bruv? So we talk like this in London, don't we? But you might not understand me because I talk really fast, innit? So my teacher voice is a middle of those. And then when I want to, if I wanted to say zucchini, I would say it in an American accent. But my favorite accent is actually like the Kim Kardashian one like this, because it sounds really annoying. And all my British friends want to kill me when I'm doing this <laughs> accent. It's great. And then I've got family, you know, that live in Australia. And in Australia, everything's so relaxed. So it's quite fun to kind of go into the accent like this and just Feel yourself chill out. Like if you're Korean and you have a garosha, did I say that right? Lifestyle, like you're working all the time here. You want to think like a garosha? Sa. Sa. Garosha. Garosha. Yeah, guys, it's hard, really hard. No wonder you have the jimjilbang. Yeah? The best place to go. So if you want to relax, you can go into an Australian accent and just chill it out a little bit. Just slow it down and sharpen the vowel sounds. Now, what's the point of doing all these different, what's the point of doing all these different accents? Well, for one, it's fun. It's really fun. And another is that it's really good to help tune your ear. Think of your ears like a radio, but not an iPhone radio, like an old school plug-in battery radio. You have to change the frequency. When I hear Korean, all I hear is, ah, I can't do it, I can't. When I hear different accents in English, I hear the Queen's English, or, or maybe I hear it like this, like an American, really annoying from the West Coast, or maybe I hear someone from the South. I'm tuning my ear to understand these accents. And you can do the same for register. So let's go from formal to informal to finish. May I extend my thanks as the queen? Thank you, neutral. Thanks, neutral. Cheers, mate. Ta. That's very, very British if you want to write that word down. Very British. Um, so that's the end of this lecture. All I can say to you is, come to London and learn English with us or learn English here and learn English with our online IELTS lectures. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me them or ask me them via our live stream chat if you're watching online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, of course.
Does anyone have any questions? No? Oh. You told me that uh, formal language and formal language. Mm -hmm. I want to know the uh, percentage. Ooh. Hmm. In spoken or in written English? Uh, spoken language. Spoken English, now? 80% informal, 20% formal. We're mostly informal when we speak. Even in, when I speak to my boss, or my, one of my bosses was visiting King's today, I said, oh, hi, Andrew, how are you? Not, hello, Mr. Hutchinson. So we're becoming more and more informal as a culture as well. So informal English is more common than formal English. And when you're writing, you need to use more formal than informal, but it changes depending on the task type. If you're doing academic writing, then you're going to be using more formal language in the entirety of your IELTS writing exam. And if you're writing for an academic purpose or to someone that you don't know, you'll be much more formal than, as I said, if, if I write a message to my mum, I'm going to be informal. She's my mother. So again, I'd say the percentage is, much, is very different. I'd say maybe 40, 60, but 40 formal, 60 informal, because we do a lot more informal conversation every day than we do formal conversation. If you're at work, think about the amount of emails to colleagues that you send back and forth all day long, or just chats, messages that you send each other. If it's someone that you know, you're not likely to be formal with them. Maybe, maybe if it's the big, big, big scary boss, but usually we use more informal in written and in spoken English. Any more questions? Oh yeah, come some neither. Okay, well, I think, you know, enjoy. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for listening to me. And I hope I've helped you get some clues about how to use register effectively, not only